Good evening, and um, welcome to the Online Wine Tasting Club. Um, I'm Alex, and this is Jamie. You probably Fantastic. know that. Should do by now, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? But if you're new, it's great to see you. Um, well, happy Malbec Day. Happy Malbec Day, uh, Sophia points out in the chat. It is indeed, as they say all around the Malbec, Happy Malbec World's Day. We do know. Happy Mal yeah. yes, it is Malbec happy World's Day, Day, not World Malbec Day, because that would make much too much sense. So anyway, we are celebrating World Malbec Day or uh, Malbec World Day. Because of the 18 grapes in Chateau Neuf de Pape, Malbec is... Not one of them. Not one of them. Not okay. one of them. Yeah. Right, so, so we're going to the Rhone Valley. So we're going to Rhone Valley, and that is the end of Malbec for now. But if anyone has any <laughs> fun Malbec stories, let's go from there. I tasted some good Malbecs today at the Waitrose tasting. Okay, right. We'll, we'll do, go do, that do you later. want to do this first, or do you want to do this later? Should we get people drinking before <sighs> they Let's get people drinking. Let's get so people drinking. Alex, Alex yeah. went to the Waitrose Spring tasting today, and has come back with some handy hints and some tasting yeah. treats and some things to do. But we'll, we'll, we'll get into that later when he stopped talking about malolactic fermentation or Britannomyces or whatever he goes off on a tangent. We can say, Alex. Tell us all about your day out, <laughs> and that would be fantastic. Do you enjoy so, the office? It's all good. The office yeah, was great. The office was fantastic. It was a wonderful day here all by myself. <laughs> to be fair, it's usually the other way around, isn't it? Um, but anyway, so those of you joining us for the first time, we have our Slido, mm. as always, so you can um, jump in and uh, put your tasting comments in there, all that kind of good stuff. Tasting notes, and you can. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll get my coat. My right. word, <laughs> we've, we've, we've started. Well, that's what way. we expect when you're wearing a t shirt. Like, what, what is going on with your t shirt exactly? Got any grapes? No, no, um, we do not. Do we do not so, got any grapes? So, where are we going today? So, yeah. we are we are doing the, the Rhone Valley, a uh, couple of bits from the northern Rhone, a couple of bits from the southern Rhone, and we should probably get the first wine in a glass, shouldn't we? Because that's what, yeah, it's I think all that's a good plan. About and, and it's worth saying that we did do a Rhone tasting, um, on our very third ever uh oh uh, the slido codes let's get that up there there we are um same one as always but probably a different qr code just to be deeply annoying um so we did our um a little memory came up on facebook um uh, when we logged on this morning which was to four years ago now four years ago i, I don't know if you four remember years, but it was uh, we were, well, it was world malbec day it was well <laughs> probably world malbec day or malbec world day we, um, <laughs> someone, someone spotted your got any grapes t shirt. Excellent. Um, uh, we, yeah, we, because I don't know if you remember, it was about, I think it was the 23rd of March, wasn't it, that we locked down, wasn't it? Or 23rd, 25th, something around then, that the, the Boris came onto the TV and mumbled away and said, blah, 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 stay at home, um, connect lives, connect the NHS, and all that stuff. Um, and said we were going to have a two-week break, circuit breaker, weren't we, or something we like that. We were indeed. And we were stuck there for a little bit we'll longer. Just do, a, do a couple of weeks yeah. of online tastings and be done with it. And yeah, you, yeah, And exactly, you've part with us yeah. for four years now. Indeed. But, for, but four years ago, there we were on Zoom with 70 people joining us from around the Tring area alone. And um, us just literally sat in our, in our individual houses chatting about Malbecs because it was Malbec World's Malbec Exactly. Day. And, um, uh, and of course, naturally, we had there, I think it was five wines to taste at the time, wasn't it? We did five. We, we did five. We started with five. We started with five. Then we upgraded to six. Yeah. Because we love everyone needing exactly. more wine. Although, although and, and, and all five of those were definitely Malbecs, weren't they, Jamie? Yes. The vast majority of them were. The vast majority Malbecs. of them were definitely. Apart Malbecs. from the, um, the Malbec Pinot Noir. The Rose. Noir, Rose, Rose one, yeah. The Malbec Pinot Noir that wasn't. But anyway, we're, we're digressing. We're <laughs> yeah. five minutes in and you're not let anyone drink. No, okay. you're, uh, All right. What are, we, what are we drinking? Wine so, number one then. So we are, we're starting off with uh, Le Cabon de Alexandre's, which is a Viognier from up in the Ardèche. So I should move the tasting notes on, shouldn't I? You should indeed. Yeah. So when we split Rome, and I'm not going to talk about this too much because we've got a little video. I, I did a voiceover and all those kind of good things. Um, so when we talk about the, the Rome, we've got, you know, 250 kilometers from north to south. We've got the northern Rhone, which is that really bit. focused on single varietals. So it's really, um, if it's white, generally Viognier is the main mm -hmm. grape up there. And if it's red, it's going to be Syrah. And then we've got the southern Rhone. Look at this. That one. That one there. And this is where we've got Cote de Rhone, Chateauneuf de Pape, Rastal that we go to a little bit later on. And this is generally based on blends, usually Grenache based. We do see some rosés and bits and pieces down there. Yep. Um, the interesting about the Rhone is you can say generally, and then the second you say generally, there's 48 <laughs> people who have done something slightly different, so the generalization is gone. 
Um, but just while you sit through this this first wine and have a thought about it, and get your tasting notes in, there's just a couple of minute video just to intro you into the Rhone Valley and what we're going to go through this evening. So uh, let's have a little look. Have See you in a couple of minutes. Yeah. See you then. Rhone grapes. Rhone Valley. Rhone style wines. Rhone Rangers. You may have heard these wine terms thrown around, but what do they actually mean? Well, first things first, the Rhone Valley, a major river in France that rises in the Alps and flows south to the Mediterranean Sea. This river lends its name to the southern French wine region on its banks, the Rhone Valley, as well as its major wine region, the Côte de Rhone. Without a doubt, some of the best value wines in the Rhone Valley, if not the entire world, can be found in the Côte de Rhone. Savvy, wine-loving consumers looking for early drinking wines with character that also won't break the bank should be taking a serious look at these wines with close to hundred million pounds worth of wine produced every year. It's a really serious region. Not only is the Côte de Rhone one of the largest appellations in all of France, it's also one of the oldest. The ancient Romans were the first people to cultivate the land for grapevines. The region began earning fame in 1737 when by royal decree it was declared that all wine barrels of the region must be branded with the initials of the area to ensure quality of the wines. The area was officially declared an AOC appellation in 1937. However, the boundaries of that original appellation have increased substantially since it was originally declared. The larger area, the Rhone Valley, is split into two distinct regions, the north and the south. The south, where we find the Côte de Rhone, is synonymous with red Grenache-based blends, with Chateau Neuf de Pape famously using up to 18 different grapes in their blends. The raging Mistral wind keeps the climate moderate and the grapes dry, which means the chance of mildew, rot and other diseases low, and therefore a long growing season, allowing winemakers to produce rich and complex wines. The Northern Rhone, on the other hand, is associated with single variety wines, such as Viognier that you find in Condru and Syrah, that you'll find in Hermitage and Croze Hermitage. The indigenous grape varieties that grow in the region, like Syrah, Grenache, Mourvedre, Viognier, Roussan, Marsan, and many others, are often referred to as Rhone grapes. So regardless of where in the world they're being grown, the wines made from these grapes have become known as Rhone varietals. So yeah, um, I'm just going to chuck it out there because I'm sure someone will call me <laughs> on it. Um, I was just listening back to that and realised that I uh, made a mistake. That, um, but was it that all of the Rhone wines that you featured there were not from the Rhone Valley? Well, there was that, but the fact that I said that the <laughs> um, the the AOC um, was granted in 1937 and it was 1933. So. Um, Sorry about that. Oh my god! The things when you just hear something, I think it's because the barrels were seventeen thirty-seven, and then when I just went through, I just said the same thing again. So doesn't matter. Doesn't so, matter. Well, hey, I'm just fine. I'm, make, good, I'm good, making good, my apologies good, to the masses. You know, absolutely. it's you know, I thought I made a mistake once. I so, was wrong. Um, already, uh, a lot of really interesting tasting notes coming in for this one. Um, it's 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 a weighty sort of super ripe wine, and this is. What you'd expect from a hot part of the world, isn't it? And it, and it is hot. I mean, what we're talking about here in the Rome is we're sort of tiptoeing down into Provence, and so as well as the all of the sort of the ripeness you'd expect from the 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 the, the fact we're in southern France, it is a hot part of the world. Um, you're also getting a few of these kind of garrigue elements. The, the the fact that the vineyards are surrounded by lots of herbaceous bushes and things like that, but. Um, but in terms of what moderates that ripeness, we talked about Le Mistral, you know, this, this famous wind. And what I think you notice at the very end of that vineyard, all of the vines are on these little kind of bush vines. They're mm. these low to the ground, really sturdy looking, quite old vines that don't have many leaves on them. Because if you've got lots of leaves, they pick up a lot of wind and they will be damaged. So, And you don't need as many leaves because the leaves are like solar panels if you're in... In England, you need a lot of solar panels to gather that light. And if you're in the so south do, of France, do we, yeah. do we have any light in England? To, uh, gather <laughs> we the haven't solar had panels. much over the last few months, have we? No, so, exactly. Yeah, um, but yeah, so v yeah. Viognier, I, I love Viognier. It's mm. a lovely, aromatic, fresh grape when it's done right. But it's very, very easy to do Viognier wrong. You pick it too early, and the acidity is far too high. It yep. takes your enamel off your teeth, and you don't get that lovely tropicalness. You pick it too late, it becomes very weighty, very yeah, flabby, definitely. very oily yeah. almost. 
So to get Viognier right is hugely, hugely mm. important. Um, so as a single varietal, it does really well. Um, when it's blended with other white wines, it can add aromatics, a little bit of acidity, a little bit of freshness to wines. <laughs> but the other thing that gets done with Viognier in, in the Northern Rhone a little bit, and also we see quite a bit in Australia, is a thing called co-fermentation. Mm. Um, and this is where they take, generally Syrah is what you find it's co-fermented with, and they'll add 2 3 4% of Viognier at the same time. So they stick all the grapes in together and do it yep. as one big shebang. So if you take a load of red grapes and you add in a little bit of white grapes, that will make it uh, lighter or darker? See, and this is the thing. You would expect it to lighten it, but the way it all goes together, Viognier gets added, A, for some aromatics, but yep. B, it makes the Syrah go darker. Because of reasons. The why I do not have. Science. Um, a little bit of a pinkish hint to it. Um, entirely possible. Um, yeah, and, 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 and it absolutely, it makes this colour deeper. The, 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 the fact is that when you put two things in together and then effectively, you can imagine if you add lemon before you cook something versus a squeeze of fresh lemon on top of it, you'll get vastly different results. Um, the the process changes those individual components. And it just so happens that when you get all of the little sort of byproducts of fermentation, all of these kind of intermediate steps that go in, fermentation isn't just take sugar, eat it, alcohol. There's, have, there's have, a lot of... Have you ever seen a hint on. that we're talking too much and not drinking enough? <laughs> Is that, uh, compare it to wine too. Yeah, yeah. At least it's not said comparing it to wine six, then we'd be really that is true. Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, co-fermentation is more like adding an ingredient before you cook it. It it does something interesting and different, not necessarily predictable in mm. the same way. So yeah, um, absolutely. But I just I think this showcases what <laughs> Viognier can be. It's it's light. It's got this freshness about yep. it. This lovely acidity, and these guys. Um, rather than, you know, a Condru could be a very, very expensive wine because that's can, a yeah. tiny little area in the, in the Northern Rhone, one of the most further, furthest north appellations in all of the Rhone Valley. Shall I, shall I pull up the picture again? Yeah, yeah it's definitely. right up there, up near the top, up right near Cote Roti. So, you know, you've got Cote Roti, you've got Hermitage, um, you've got Condru and Hermitage are probably the the big regions, maybe Cornas are the, yeah. the ones that you're going to hear in that area. You've got saint Pere, which is a little further south, which makes some really cool wines. Yeah, we were and going to try to put one of those in. We just couldn't get it. We couldn't, couldn't find we? anyone so who had enough wine. of the same <laughs> wine. It's yeah. like, oh, I've got eight bottles of this one right. and 12 bottles of that one. So if everyone wanted to have a different wine, yeah. we could have done that. But I couldn't find anything that uh, there was enough of it. Um, and they do Roussan, Marsan. Sometimes they do some blends yeah. there, which is kind of cool because you don't see a lot of blends in, in the Northern Rhine. Oh, no. But this is where we're at. But I just think this is bright flat. And, you know, you look at the tasting notes for a fairly, I feel a fairly simple wine. There's a lot going on it, a lot going on. I think so. Um, I think it's it's definitely, I, I find it quite aromatic, but um, not in that kind of overly floral way that you get with some things like a kind of, well, let's say a... Uh, it's not uh, Alvarino-esque. No. It's not... Grunery over the top floral. It's not Riesling. -y. It's not Riesling. It's, it's certainly not into that Gewurz from any kind of rose petal it's all lavender thing. thing. Yeah, and, it's um, it's but, nice, fresh, tropically. Yeah, it's a, it's a really lovely wine. It, it, it's definitely a foodie wine as well. As far as whites go, this is this will go with something with a bit of substance, won't it? Yeah, you know, you can go and you know this. You could get away with kind of like salad, mm. like a like a caprese salad or something like that, because it's got that little bit of herbaceousness going through. Or, you know, chicken or something, you know, lighter, like veal or veal scallop or something like that would be really good. Yeah, it. yeah. Um, but, you know, we've got we've got lots of different, you know, we've got that little bit of citrus, that little bit of grassy. We've got lots of peach and, you know, the, the Guava, kind of stone fruits. Honey. And then we've got yeah. the, I mean, but I think that one of the important things in there is that someone's popped the word clean in there. Mm. That it's nice, it's fresh, it doesn't have any, it's not hiding anything. It's very pure. It's a very pure wine, I think, is a... yeah. It does have a floral note, absolutely. It is in that floral category, but it's not in that 
massively petty kind of way. Yeah, and, it's it's not know. gone rose petal, elder flower, like massive bouquet of it that, that blows your head yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, quite Very right. well balanced. It, it is, and it's got the acidity to cut through that, which it absolutely needs to do. And I think that's what you're, you're, you're absolutely right about. If you were to harvest that a little bit later, it would probably go downhill very quickly. Absolutely. And a very delicious start to the evening. I like that. Well balanced. Yeah. Like two badges on a seesaw. Quite right. Exactly. Quite right. Assume they're the same weight. Um, Badges only come in one size. No, I, I like that. Um, so the Rhone Valley itself, it, it's it's cut quite deep, you know, particularly when you go up towards that northern Rhone side, you, you see really steep sides. Like you get down towards Avignon, it's a bit wider, a bit more gentle. Um, and there is a bridge, of course, there in Avignon where you, one could dance. One could dance, I think. Da, 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 you know, it's the song. Anyway. Um, um, <laughs> By the way, can someone take, I need someone, because he had holiday snaps last month and holiday honeymoon talk. Can we count his horrible <laughs> Rhone versus when in Rome puns tonight? Because he's just... Oh, come on. As if you didn't do it all last time. Anyway. Well, this tasting wasn't built in a day. Well, no, indeed. Indeed. Um, so, um, but yes, I, I think, I think, I think Beyond the Aether, it, it's, it's a, it's a wine that speaks of its place. It speaks of that warmth. It speaks of the drama. You still get that kind of stony mineral side. And I think you saw it in, in the videos there, particularly around the Chateau neuf du Pat, where you've just got all these quite deep stones everywhere. And they kind of moderate the uh, it beautifully. Fantastic. So we can skip the skip the keep up today. We can skip the taste notes on yeah. to uh, to the to next wine and see what people are thinking about. So this is um this tasting, this next one, is kind of when is Rhone not really Rhone anymore? Because mm-hmm. if we bring up the, the the map of the Southern Rhone, we can um we can see if we bring up the map of the Southern Rhone. Okay, we we're going for that. Um, Southern we, Rhone, where's it gone? Sorry, I'm on the wrong bit. There we yeah. are, Southern Rhone. We we can see where we are is here. We're in Lubron, so we're all the way in this southeast. We're basically Provence, so yeah. Lubron is sandwiched between. Um, basically the Rhone and Provence. So this area makes lots of different styles. It makes some good rosés, it makes some light style reds, it makes some heavy Syrah-based reds, and it makes some fantastic, fantastic um, white wines. Mm. So this is a um, this is a bit of a blend. It's got a little bit of everything in it. It's got some Roussel, it's got some uh, Grenache Blanc, it's got some Claret, and it's got some Bouba Blanc. Um, however... And if we've got we've got level three and diploma students on there, um, once again, correct me if I'm wrong here, because I was doing my research about Bourbonc and Claret Blanc, and um, came across the idea that they're actually the same grape, <laughs> and they're called something different depending quite where it's grown. It's kind of like a yeah a clone esque kind of thing, but they're kind of the same grape, a bit like Zinfandel Primitivo, but. Please tell me if I'm wrong, because my text sheet here tells me it's 30% Bourbon, 30% Claret, but is there therefore 60% yeah. Bourbon. But there we are. And a little bit of Grenache Blanc that gives some nice weight, and a little bit of Roussan that gives a little bit of toastiness to it. So this is Chateau La Vierre. <laughs> and this is 2020 vintage, so a little bit of age on this. So you're getting this a little bit more richness, there's a little bit more toastiness yeah. to it. It's a little bit more of the honey, nutty kind of characteristics in there. You've got a bit of nutty characteristics. I do indeed. So um, we are, I mean, we are bang on talking about Provence here. So for those of you who um, are of my age or older, you've probably read A Year oh. in Provence by Peter Mayle and its subsequent follow-ons. Of, was it Toujol Provence? And I can't remember the other one, but... Um, they are set in the Luberon region, in um, in the village of Minelb, which is uh, really right at the heart of it. So we are, when he described Le Mistral ripping through uh, his not quite finished villa, it, 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 this is this is this is, gives you that sort of sense of it is cold winds. It's not just strong winds; they are cold, and so that helps again, just like sort of give the vines a little bit of relief. Like from this un- un- unbearing heat, which which starts hitting now, 
as, as early as as early as now, we're we're sort of heading up way beyond twenty degrees. We're sort of towards thirty degrees um, in this time of year, and it's 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 a vast amount of heat for the mines. Currently. And and especially you know we, we've talked about <laughs> it already. We've touched on these these big pudding stones yeah. that sit there that just yes, absorb that was, uh, heat that. like it's their job. Sophia said that. Um, yeah. So you know that is there, and so if you haven't got something cooling. Mm-hmm everything's going to bake because yeah. you're not going to get that level of cooling overnight no. if you've not got something to help it no, a little indeed, bit because indeed. those stones will keep it nice and warm. So, you know, it does depend what you're trying to grow. It does well for some things, less well for yeah. others. But the real big thing about this um, this wind coming through is the fact it keeps it dry. Dry, Which yeah. means no mildew, no disease and it means these wines can get, you, you, when you look in the Rome where we go to you know, we're getting alcohol sometimes of 15, 15 and a half 16% mm-hmm. and say what you may about that down to personal opinion, but they can get those styles because they can leave the fruit hanging on the vine to get really, really ripe, really, really yeah. bold, lots of sugars in there that if they didn't have that in this trapped kind of canyon, mm-hmm. if you didn't have that wind coming through, you get kind of the wet water sinking and you just end up with rot to mildew and nothing good would come of that. No, no. Um, this particular uh, wine, it talks about the haute colline, uh, which is the sort of the high hilly kind of bits. So we are a little bit higher up. Obviously, you, when you go inland from... The, from the Mediterranean, you, you you reach quite a big sort of plateau that you suddenly go up to, and um, yeah, absolutely, you 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 find that that little bit of height helps things as well, doesn't it? So um, just helps keep things a bit cooler. They've got some um, fifty six hectares uh, planted uh, around their estate, and yeah. um, they've actually got a bit of history, haven't they? Like the 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 family, um, it, 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 the, today the grandson of uh, Jean Louis. Uh, he runs the estate, um, but they they used to be the owner of um, uh, Charles Heidzik, uh, Piper Heidzik, and of course the Biondi Santi uh, winery in uh, in Italy. Um, so some some level of, of heritage there. Well, yeah. So this this winery's been around since well, 1981. Mm-hmm. So it's it's older than me, <laughs> <laughs> but not older than me. Oh, sorry about that. It's been the, the theme of wines this week, hasn't it? Um, ah. So Cathy says that Bourbon and Claret are different. So, um, I mean, the, this is the thing, but then there are lots of different degrees of difference. So lots of people say um, Pinot Noir and Pinot Noir Precus are the same grape because you look at the DNA, they are don't, the same. Don't, don't, say, don't say that they to an English winemaker. They perform completely differently and do very different things flavor-wise. That's definitely linked. So um, I, 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 I don't know what the, the history is of this one, but yeah. Um, it's a weighty wine, just a, but at thirteen and a half percent, it's um, it is hiding a little bit. Um, well, I think this is just a really good example of that kind of Rhone style blend, isn't it? The white style. It is. It is. Um, it's not with quite that, as Marsani as. It's not. That's because there's no Marsan no. in there. That's why it's not very Marsani. Genius that. Um, but it is. You know, it's um. I think it's, it's, you know, mm. grapes that usually when we talk about Southern Rome, we talk about, uh, you know, Roussel and Marsan and Grenache Blanc are kind of the big yeah. three. But to see some of these other grapes in there taking a, a dominant yeah. part of it, it's really kind of cool to be a little bit different. Some lovely taste notes, a little bit of Grieg in there, sal- the salinity. We're not, we're not a million miles from the sea there. Um, but the oregano and uh, anise, this, this is wonderful stuff, herbaceousness. Crunch nut cornflakes, I think, is my favourite. Crunchy nut um, cornflakes. Someone them. now, this is an excellent question. So, it is a lovely balance, but it does it have a bit of residual sugar? Now, there is super, super ripe fruit in it, isn't there? Yes, it's really. It's got that wonderful. I mean, the honey note that everyone's picking up gives you that impression that it's got a bit of a bit of sweetness in it. But, but. No, it actually is about as dry as wines come. Um, it is um, it is naught point three grams per liter of sugar, which is so, somewhere between nothing and bugger all. Exactly, the slim, slim to none. Um, yeah. So there's what what you can do if you if you want to check <clears throat> sweetness um, in a wine if you're not sure because 
the way when we taste something and we taste things like honey and melon and stuff like that we know those as sweet foods so our brain automatically goes there must yeah. be sugar because this flavor reminds me of sweet and this is when we talk about taste we don't want to get fruity or honeyed and sweet confused because sweet no. is there's either sugar or there's not sugar or there's some sugar yeah mm -hmm. so it's, it's you can measure sweetness as a fact flavor is all personal but the way your mouth works your tongue you taste the sweetness on the very tip of your tongue so if you take your glass of wine give it a little swell and take a sip oh, i'm going to try to do this live right you're going to stick your tongue in yeah and then you just put the very tip of your tongue into the wine if you pinch your nose as well that even better and then you look like a proper idiot especially if you're doing this in the middle of a Michelin-starred so restaurant if you get that wine and it's just cold and wet and that's all it is there's no sugar in there however if there is sugar you will feel the weightiness you'll feel the, the weightiness of the sugar on the tip of your tongue mm -hmm. and you'll know you've got some sugar in there yeah so but no um but isn't that crazy that you can have something that tastes of so many sweet things and gives you that impression it's wine well, wine is one of the sugar. very few things in the world that we don't often say <laughs> this is actually what it tastes like i don't go this tastes like mm. bourbon from rome no, i'd say this tastes of honey and nuts and the, Everything else, we say this tastes of what it is. Beef tastes like beef. <laughs> and we say that's what True. it tastes like. But wine, we have all these kind of things. And because, you know, as we get these riper fruits where it's a little bit warmer, that's the understandability that you think there could be sugar in there because it's got sweet fruit flavours, but it's fruity rather than sweet, if that makes sense. I agree. I agree. Um, it's a really nice wine. I, I like it. Um, yeah, it's not super high in acidity as well. It's it's about five grams per litre of acidity, which is, um, yeah, I, I would say is at that kind of slightly lower end. It, but it's mm. enough to it's enough to be in balance. But it's yeah, it I think we've got the thing because yeah, and it is it is that whole thing about balance because we've got a decent amount of acidity, but not <coughs> high. But we've also got quite a high amount of alcohol in there. You know, at thirty and a half percent for a white. So it is that kind of. Well, uh, no, I'm learning something today because I've always been taught the tip of the tongue. So this has probably been disproven recently. I would love to hear a bit more about that. And apparently it is all over the tongue. How interesting. Oh. Uh, and and uh... to be fair, but, you know, when I'm when I'm just when I'm when, I, when I'm just when yeah. I'm just tasting, um, when I'm just tasting, you know, I don't need to use my whole tongue for sweetness. It's a waste That's of the fair. other bits That's of it. Fair. So I'm going to save the tip. Disproven or not, I'm just saving the tip of my tongue for sweetness. Mm -hmm. There we go. That makes, that makes sense. Um, we're about to move on to reds now, aren't we? We are indeed. We are indeed. Before we before we move on to reds, yeah. Do you want to talk do? about? Do you want to talk about the term of the month before we go to the reds? In case there's any sweaty horses. Ah, oh, Britannomyces. Do, do, do you need the note? You're a winemaker. Okay, you know all, all right. about it. Well, don't you? yeah. I mean, so Brett. Um, yeah, as, as you can see, I probably have strong opinions about this one, but... Um, Not the Hitman heart. Um, there are a lot of people who are absolutely clear that um, Britannomyces, which is this bacteria which produces horsey medicinal sort of plaster flavours, um, uh, or slightly bacony ones. You particularly get it in a bit in, like, Coke Rati, don't you? That sort of, like... You can. You can. Uh, that bacony I'm, I, side. I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the side that I think Brett is a fault. Yeah, it's... For, for me, it's absolutely a fault, because if you get it into your winery, you Good basically God. have to burn the winery down and, you know, like, sanitise everything, and you probably still can't get rid of it. It's it's a fault in the same way that we, we are... We talk about weeds not being weeds because they're just plants. They're just existing, man. They're just existing. But they spread like weeds. Britannomyces spreads like a fault. It is a fault. Uh, Sophia, absolutely, 100% a fault. Um, but you do if, you, if it's out there in the vineyards, maybe you're farming with uh, horses, um, then, yeah, you know, it's. It, I can see the argument for why you'd say it's past the character. This is a very horsey country let's say, and that's just part of it. But I don't like it. A tiny little bit of it definitely defines a wine. Um, <laughs> it can give it a character. It, it can help you place it if you're trying to blind taste it, for sure. But for me, 
it is, yeah, it, it lurks in all sorts of places, as Sophia says, particularly in oak. You can never properly sanitize yeah. these oak your cups. So you your, your barrels, steam it, you your can, cardboard boxes that you're packing the wines in, it can yeah. get into your corks, any day it can go. It, it, it can it's go it's a tough one to get rid of, um, and it's very easy for it to get out of control. So I think if it's come from the vineyard and it's there, I get, I get an argument for it. And so I think I it, don't, if, I don't if, totally hate it. It's, I just, it's, yeah. If people... Are there and it, oh, no, I hate say if it adds character because yeah. it's meant to add character, that's fine. But it's the people who use it as an ex, as an excuse. Uh, yeah, I, th I think I think that's the overwhelming thing they had is like you get not you, not this had not, a bit of bad wine, not dissimilar to, to leaf roll in pinotage. It's just yeah. the style, man. No, no, you had sick vines. Oh, we were talking about pinotage um, last tasting, weren't we? And. Um, I was a little bit dismissive. Today, I tried the Cannon Cop Pinotage for the first time, and I, I actually really liked it. It was very good. So all, all is forgiven, um, as long as it's from one of the wineries which doesn't have this leaf roll disease. So, so yeah. yeah but, we, th we, thought, we thought Brett was an important thing to bring up yes, for it, the it fact feels... that love it, hate it, enjoy it's it, but it is part of winemaking, and it is yeah. particularly part of the Rhone Valley. Yep, yep. Indeed. And whether you like it or not will guide you towards, you know, a Rhone Grenache Syrah Mourvedre blend or a Grenache you know, or just a pure Syrah versus one that's made by such as the Rhone Rangers that we talked about in the video. These guys who went and took all of the Rhone wine uh, grapes and uh, put them in amazingly cool places like, you know, Tabas Creek in California or um, down in South Africa. There were some really cool ones. Actually, I tried a great Aussie Viognier today. That was good. Um, Jamie Good is a fan of um, a little bit of Brett, isn't he? Uh, so, yeah, uh, I have not read that book Flawless yet. I've read some of his books. I haven't read that one. So I will have to do that. Um, Brett seems to work on uh, best on some corner. So I think that's a, that's a reasonable call. I as think. long as the winemakers aren't cutting corners. Cutting Brett. Okay. No. 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 Okay. All right. That's all, right. all good. We're, so we're, let's move on to. Oh. That was that's far too much time on something that no one wants. <laughs> okay. So we are going to to what I think is 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 my my favourite region in the north northern Rhone because it is like no other. Like if you are doing a blind tasting, you pick you pick this up and go, that's Crozet Hermitage, okay. and people go, why is that Crozet Hermitage? And it is because it is. It just is. I don't know why. But Crows is one of my... That's one, one of, of your those, ones that you find. I, I have no idea. For me, for me on red wines, Crows is the equivalent of Marlborough Sauvignon in whites. You just I think I'd have more go, of a chance of Viognier than this. I don't know. You know. It's got this earthiness to it. It's got this petrol to it. It's got this spice to it. But it's got this elegance. You know it's not anything else because it's not massive enough to be one of the big boys. It's not light enough to be something silly and simple. And you just go, it is Crows. All right. Um, I opinion. moved the tasting notes on. Um, so, 100% Syrah here. 100% Syrah. So, um, the 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 name Shav, um, this is uh, Jan Shav, and um, he's taken over from his parents who started the uh, vineyards in the 1970s. Um, the name Shav um, is pretty synonymous with, like, sort of wines of... The road, the northern road, oh, and particularly of Almitage. And in fact, the Chave family, um, JL Chave, Jean Louis Chave, um, his, his family go back to 1481 from when they've been uh, making wines and in the some, Valley. Some, some of the best, yeah. the best wines. Um, I, I, was, I was lucky enough when randomly in Germany, um, I was blind tasted on a really? bottle of 94 JL Chave, nice. and it was. It was phenomenal, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah, and so I feel duty bound to point out at this point that this is not the same Shard family as Yan who makes this. So sorry about that, but 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 um, we couldn't quite get the Jean Louis Shard in the budget for this one. Um, um, and then they're hard to get hold of as well because they're such collectible wines. Um, oh, absolutely. I had I had I had one um, a couple of months ago, but it was um, it was very good. It was, it was definitely very good. Um, it was a bit young. I, mean, I felt like I was committing infanticide on it. Well, yeah, so this is 20, 21 vintage. Um, so, you know, 
it's got a couple of years. Something like this. I like the fact that this is absolutely drinkable now. Drink it now. Drink it now. Drink it now. Um, but it will develop over the next 10, 12 years. You'll get more tertiary, more of that kind of forest floor, that, all that earthiness coming through. Um, mm. But yeah, I just... It's just, you know, you've got the colour, you know, the deep dark fruits, that black currant, and then it comes through with the woodiness, that little bit of spice, that little bit of pepper that you know you've got a Syrah or a Shiraz. It almost sounds like I'm just talking through the tasting notes you've just put up in front of me. <laughs> like I don't have a clue what you, I'm talking about. And I, just, smoked and, and I just wait for the people. Well, you know, you've got to wait till the very end for that little bit of smoked mackerel, smoked mackerel yeah. just to roll. Your gun flint. Um, um, uh, someone's made a petrol note on that. And um, uh, uh, Kevin was pointing out that he does like a bit of petrol and reasonings. I do too. I do like that. I don't think that's necessarily a fault. I think that's that's part of the character. And I think that's, it's like, is it an external influence or is it coming from the, and I think that's that's the only reason I think of, uh, you know, Brett as a fault. It's because it's coming from something that isn't in the grapes. And whereas I don't believe that the, the petrol note is coming from anything that's that's going in there by mistake it's just a sort of character of it but it's a it's um it's definitely old world this isn't it but they they've i mean the the the, the guys who've been making this they they um he he makes it with his son and daughter and they've gone and worked vintages all around the world they've been the classic traveling winemakers living the dream going off to australia going off to south africa and and learning a bit about that new world thing which i think comes into that there's a lot of fruit in it still mm. So the the once again going to going to rieslings, um, the uh, the 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 petrol the petrol on rieslings a lot of the time comes down to sunburnt grapes. So the uh, grapes get a little bit too much sun, it changes the chemicals within yeah. within the skin and gives that. So it used I, to be, I did hear a thing about it, it being used to one be that doesn't pop up until like a couple of years yeah. after. Yeah, so, but a lot of people yeah. go, oh, it's it's a sign of aged riesling. Yeah, it's not always because the reasoning is old is because yeah. of what happened what with it's, it's it. not a developmental character as is put here it's a primary flavor but it comes from the sunburning um of the grapes or too much sunshine yeah yep. and then as it ages that flavor will come out but that's nothing to do with it aging does that make sense yeah yeah My dear Riesling tastes as though it's been in a petrol tanker. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, Excellent. <laughs> would, okay, we're, we're going off here. Would anyone be opposed to, um, in July, because it's the 31 days of German Riesling, just doing a full six-pack Riesling tasting? Can we do that? Like We try to have a little blend in there so we don't upset anyone that they don't get their reds or they don't get this. Um, anyone anti having just a... Bang, let's do all the Rieslings, all the styles, all the Aus Laces, Spat Laces, Beer and Aus Laces, keep everybody we happy. We did German wine law not that long ago, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, so, but I oh, do, no, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please, yes, please. Alex is going to book a holiday for that one. I'd love to do a full Riesling taste it. All right, I'm clearly outvoted on okay. that one. That's fine. All July right, will okay. be Riesling. Okay. <laughs> All right. But anyway, back to Rhone. Fine, back to Rhone. We talked about Malbec and Riesling and everything. Yeah. Um, how would you compare a Crow's Almitage to a plain Almitage? <laughs> plain. Because the, ridge, the OG Almitage. Yep. OG Taj. Yeah. Because so, it's a bit like it's sort of a, um, like if we were in Italy, it would be almost like a. Hermitage Classico, wouldn't it? If you look at the actual so it, well, layout if, if, of... If you, if, you take, if you take Italy, for example, yeah, I would say your, your comparison of Hermitage to Crows is probably your equivalent of Barolo to Barbaresco. Okay. So, same grape. Yeah. Lots of the same winemaking techniques. Mm -hmm. Both absolutely fantastic, but they have their distinct style. The uh, Hermitage is generally... Designed to age a little bit longer, yep. generally a little bit more premium, more sought after, and it's built to be this bigger, heavier, weightier, spicier wine. Um, so yeah, so Hermitage to Crow's Hermitage, I feel is your Barolo to your yeah. Barbaresco. Yep. Yeah. Um, so Crow's generally more affordable, generally yep. more drinkable right now. Still a very nice complex wine. 
but not the same complexity as well. So, so um, when um, I, can't, I can't remember the year it changed. Um, so I'm going to be an idiot and can't remember. Um, All right, you can look it but, up. Um, Penfolds used to make a Syrah. Yep. That was called Hermitage. They did, yes, so, indeed. So yeah. Penfolds Grange was called Hermitage for the <laughs> longest time um, because it was um, they were going after that style to push themselves away from being yeah. Aussie Shiraz. I think the... Hermitage is a lot more dramatic as well with the slopes. And when you look at the, the, those famous ones right up on the, the east banks of the, the, the river as it goes around, um, it, it's, it's, it's absolutely Germanic in its kind of steepness, isn't it? And, mm. um, and yeah, as Sophia says, mainly granite, but lots of other little bits and pieces that, that sit around there. Now, I'm liking the idea of people talking back, going back to your reasoning of not just German. How about we, we, we need to get in a few others. Maybe we get a Finger Lakes in there and an Australian one, just as a bit of a benchmark point to go in. Like, what does it taste like in a completely different place? So, well, so, uh, so do two packs, six Germans, <laughs> six rest of the world, and with are twirls right. riesling. Okay, we can do an all white as long as we can do an all red one as well. So, uh, uh, on a different they don't, day, they don't, maybe, maybe they we don't do make a, red rieslings. Let's do an entire Cabernet Sauvignon from Napa Valley one. That sounds good. I've got, I've got one of them. Have you? Yeah, where do you go? Oh, really? In in Coravan. Oh, the mini thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah, we have got that actually. Yeah, haven't we? we talk about that. We can talk okay. about that later. Right. That wasn't actually a setup. So, but was yes. it not? Oh, right. I, th- I thought you one. were trying to be to sell other products in the show. Fair enough. Okay, anyway, it wasn't we, trying we are to. Horribly digressing. We are. Today. You, you've obviously been out of the waitress <laughs> days. Okay, right. So, have you got anything else to add for advertising? We have another look at the tasting notes. Those tasting notes have gone There's mental. A, the, again. That's gone absolutely mad. I love it. Mulberry, metallic, yeah, there is that kind of like sort of almost like irony feeling to this. Um, <laughs> can it be a weekend for 12 reasons? Cab Sauvignons of the world, that's what I'm talking about, Sophia. Yeah, I'd love to do that one. Mm. Um, <clears throat> spice, smoke, prune. So, we're getting it, we're getting it. What's the vintage on this one? This is 21. 21. So, it's not an it's not an old wine, but it's already starting to develop some of those kind of s- slightly tertiary flavors in there. Although, albeit primarily from the the wine grapes and the the winemaking, so there we are. Someone is fine. Who's who's financing? If you say it, you yeah. finance it. This sounds good. They it does indeed. Sound good. So right. So we are going to head for our, our final three wines. We are going to be in um, Southern Rhone, we are. where we're going to blend. We're going to go to Grenache-based blends across all three. Yeah. Um, so if you want to pour bits and taste them all side by side, you can go backwards and forwards if you want to. Or you know, Yeah, we tried, we tried to least, do the actual recreate your own blend one in the past. It didn't work brilliantly. It didn't work very well at all. We, we actually have something um, on the cards, which could be quite an interesting blending one. We have... Um, uh, we've been we were chatting to uh, a good friend called Robert Joseph, who is um, uh, who we met at the wine uh, the Vin Expo in Paris, and um, he has just put together a whole set of Georgian blends, and uh, they're really good. They 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 display the kind of clever thinking that Robert's known for of both combining character and but also with accessibility it's not just one of those crows up because i like oh, yeah. okay um not just one of those absolutely out there georgian wines which is uh, barely drinkable so um so yes he had offered to come on and help us have some of the component wines to see how they taste individually um so we thought we might give it a go again on that occasion so are they good for georgia no they're good on a global scale they were actually genuinely uh there was a mixture of a couple of international varieties in there um it wasn't just all crazy, quivery kind of wine making in big clay and for it. It was a, it was a mixture of some oaks, some stainless steel, a temperature control, some you know, a, a whole bunch of stuff going on, and and it got up to. I think that, that I think one of them had about twenty different grapes in it, didn't it? Or twenty different components from different things. So that was um that was a very but cool I, I, wine I think try. I think that's that's a, the really good point to go. Are they good for George and all good on a global scale? Because there's there's so much access to good wine now. Yes. So much access to good wine, and it used to be when I when I got into the mm-hmm. first into the wine industry twenty ish years ago, um, there was always this caveat. You say, "Oh, this is pretty good 
for a whatever, or this is, you know, not bad for an English wine or not bad for a Virginia no, wine or no. something like that. And I think we've got to move away from that. The wine has to be good on its own merits. But I think that's got to flip, go on the other side as well. That if you've got a really good Chardonnay from, let's pick a country that I've not had a lot of Chardonnay from, Ecuador, okay? Yeah. Why can't an Ecuadorian Chardonnay, if it's the quality is good enough, be priced the same as a Chablis? Yeah, why why not? Why not? Well, I mean, that is indeed the question. Uh, yeah, but there there are the, you can do this in London as well, can't you? You got you got bought one of these. Yeah, sessions, um, I didn't think you? so. I think <laughs> L- L- London Crew um, yeah do that in London as well. That you can go and blend some bits and pieces. I think they let you make your own little blend and and take some home with you as well. So um, you can uh, you can do that in London as well. And yeah, it's a good it's a good experience. A good experience. All right, so I'm going to get some Rasto. Okay. And you're going to talk about blending. Am I? Yes. Oh, okay. Um, huh. Right. So, blending. Right, thanks, thanks. <laughs> Putting well, me on the spot. Being, being the winemaker. Yeah, but blending's um, not... Well, okay, right. So, blending. All wines are blends. All, all, all Virtually all wines are blends of... Different bits. You you can't make a wine. We, we've we've spoken about this in the past. Apologies if you've heard us talk about this. But if you have a Pinot Noir from a single vineyard, you are probably still trying a blend. It, because even if you've done exactly the same thing to all of the different components, like like let's say you haven't separated the vineyard into box. Let's say you just harvested it all on one day. And you brought it in, and you fermented it with the same yeast, and you put it into a hundred different barrels. Right, well, those barrels are all going to develop slightly differently. Yes, there will be commonalities to them, but they will all develop slightly differently. And when you put it all back together, you're putting it from all of those barrels into a blend. And but the reality is that's not the most sensible way to do it. You will split up your vineyard if it's of a, over a reasonable size into this is the lower part, this is the higher part. So this had a lot more sun. This bit got... Uh, was was tilting a little bit more to the south, so it got a little bit more sun in the mornings and on, uh, or overall over through the day. And there's lots and lots of different um, bits to this that you could then separate out. And then you start looking. You can um, send up a plane or a drone, probably these days, which has got various um, uh, cameras that look at um, lights being uh, uh, reflected back in different spectrums. So you can look and you can see exactly how much photosynthesis is going on in different bits. That might be down to an underground water source. But again, it just lets you find where there are different blocks. And so you, that will give you a clue that where you'll be developing different flavours. So you keep them separate. It gives you something new to put in to the final wine. So you could still end up with a single clone Pinot Noir from a single vineyard on a single site. They might even be harvested the same day. But it's still a blend. So we've got to get over this kind of, um, you know, uh, what, what do you say? Like this, this kind of bad reputation that blends have. They're not just a way of making a wine cheap. Yes, you can use it. Let's, oh God, this is a bit of a bad wine. Let's let, this is underripe. Let's blend it with something that's a little bit yeah. more ripe. You um, can do that. So there's, there's, there's two things. I think. Okay. So if, if we, if we go the single variety, we know they're blended. They're not blended because people go single yeah. for single single grape from a single place, single this, great yeah. wine. Okay. And that is phenomenal if A is a grape you like to drink, mm-hmm. and B, you get the right conditions year in, year out to make world class wine. Yeah, and, and and some customers are more accepting of vintage variation than others. Like if you're selling to a supermarket, they pretty much want to be buying the same thing year after year. So um, whereas if you're like Kathy and you've got a specific block that's doing something super cool and you've identified that, well, yeah, why not keep that to one side and, and do something different with it? But still, even then, you might find that um, you might use a different yeast on one bit. So you might use new oak on part of it. You might use old oak on part of it. And they'll give very different characteristics to that wine. So it, it, you, you want to have something with complexity. But every now and then, the blending process dials out what's distinctive from that one little site. I, I also or think that the, 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 the blends sometimes don't get as much love as they should because in the wine world, we're not always 
told that these things are no. blends. When you're first getting wine, and I, you know, I'm guessing you know most people on this on this station are going to know this. But you hear Bordeaux or Claret, you mm-hmm. know, as a thing. You don't know that that's a blend. No one says that's no. a blend. It doesn't say on the bottle generally that it's got some Cabernet, no. some Cabernet Franc, that kind of stuff in it. Rhone, blend. Mm-hmm. No one tells you. Um, this just says Appellation Rasto Controle. And, and you're supposed so, to know that it's Grenache Syrah by magic. Yeah, no yeah. mention of the grapes. Oh, okay, no, there is little mention of the grapes. But, yeah. but it's it's minimized. It's it's in the two-point text on the you know, it's not it, so. good. You know, the single variety, generally, especially when it's New World, goes bang! Cabernet Sauvignon. Bang! Yeah. Sauvignon Blanc, easy. And then... Um, but, actually, it's just worth interrupting for a second because... It's always worth interrupting. It's always worth interrupting, but... Because that's the other thing. I was at a wedding last year, and um, I had on the table the wonderful choice between three different wines, all with a kangaroo on the front of them. One of them was white, and two of them uh, were red. And one was Syrah, for Shiraz, and the other was Merlot. Now, if you read all of your wine tasting notes, you will know that Shiraz and Merlot give quite very different profiles, don't they? You can't call the wine Shiraz unless it's at least 85% Shiraz. And you can't call it Merlot unless it's 85% Merlot. However, these wines tasted exactly the bloody same. They were both um, um, square bracket wines that I don't want to, to, to slag off. But, but quite clearly, the fact that it has a kangaroo on the label and the name for it was almost more important than the variety at that point. And... Yes, that is, I think, the takeaway, that you can blend in so many different things. You could make something that's Pinot Noir, 85% in America, but it's got 15% Zinfandel oh. in it, to, or a bit of Petit Syrah to or something, to just colour. add a bit of colour and add a bit of... Uh, and there are people in the UK, we're talking about people using Pinot Noir clone 777 in the UK. Well, they, they might be doing that, but there are a few Pinot clones that are just there really for giving colour. Mm. Or they could be blending in some of these... Early ripening red um, hybrid grapes, which are again just there because you don't want your red wine to look like a rose in the UK. So exactly, yeah. Um, but anyway, my 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 hey, point I was nothing. No idea what I meant. My with point that. was nothing to do with that. Blends um, cool. But the fact is, if you got that, if you got that single place, that single thing, that and it's great, it's great, yeah, yeah. And that's like having a great piece of steak, yeah. If you've got a phenomenal piece of steak and you can go. Shh, shh, See you later. Mm-hmm. It's done. Yeah. Yep. If you like that, but if you've got that piece of meat and you go, oh, I want to add a bit of salt, a bit of pepper, a bit of spice, a bit of this. We'll do some potatoes with it. That's what blending is. You can take these different components and end up with something absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Because two percent petite verdot can add this to it, and four percent that can add this to it. And you know, when I first got into wine, it was kind of like. What is the point of adding one percent petite for dough? <laughs> oh, well, ask Yellowtail. Ask Yellowtail. Um, yes, they're making one like nobody else. Absolutely. <laughs> um, but that one percent petite verdot, where it's got a very aromatic one, is is can be really super important. Mm. Or um, or like petite Syrah as well is a, is another one which makes a huge impact to a final blend, but without necessarily doing it. And and that's even before you get into that co-fermenting things. Anyway, someone called Penny Taylor remembers the Pixar vineyard we went to. That would be John Laster's vineyard. Yes, it was all about the story of the blend, and the wines were really good. Um, his French was less good, um, but his on the flip side, his animated movies are brilliant. So mm-hmm. I shouldn't really complain. Um, yeah. Anyway, let's go to Rasto. Rasto. Lift. Rasto. So Rasto is if we've got the map again. Um, he's kind of bang center in the uh, in the Southern Rhine. Um, I can't really see it. Where are we? So Vakira. Go, go to right Rasto, side. north, northeast. So we're going Chateauneuf du Pape is that little bit just northeast of Avignon, and then Rasto is next to Gigonda, just up from there. Yeah. So, so you're yeah. kind of central, easty, kind of boom. Quite a little way away from the river. It is. That's it is. Fine. But being a little way away from the river, it loses some of that that moderating mm-hmm. that you get from the river. Hence why we have a 15% um, <laughs> big boy. Is this so a big one? So this is... Which are we on for the right one? Yeah. Ribena. I know oh, what you're drinking. Ribena. Um, 
so you know this is big it's bold it's fruity it's jammy it's got spice but again so, less than one gram a liter of sugar so the jamminess isn't unlike for example our friends in the Aberdeen Antipodean side of the world yes, it isn't it's, sugar it's, yeah like so you got ribena there it's flavored with ribena it fla tastes like ribena <laughs> But you haven't got the sugar like Ribena. It's not um, flavoured with Ribena. Just, just before we get sued by Domaine Bressy Masson. Um, yeah, no, exactly. It, it it tastes like that, but it doesn't have the sugar. Um, and it's very fruity. Um, really, very quite approachable. It is. Nice. So Southern Rome, we are generally Grenache led. So yeah. when we talk about the different grapes down there, Grenache is rich, adds fruit, adds body. Mm -hmm. Syrah is a lot about the structure and the spice. Mavedra gives weight when it comes comes out to it. Um, when we get to Chardonnay, to put, there's there's 18 grapes that you can use to blend, and they are they're nice. They're nice oh, grapes. You, you're not, you're not yeah, I'm not jumping grapes. in on that one. I thought you they were they were shown up on the list earlier. I can't. I'm not going to be a, your performing monkey. I'm instead going to mention that this is uh, right next to an area called Les Vaches or the Cows, um, and um, it. Uh, it, it leads me to my my favourite French adjective, uh, which is vachement. So uh, if you would say it's really hot today, you'd say, oh, c'est oh, vachement chaud aujourd'hui. Uh, vachement means like a cow. It's hot, like a cow. <laughs> Why the cow was hot, I'm not sure, but there we are. Uh, vachement. Because or if you just want to swear, you can say, oh, la vache. <laughs> <laughs> Makes no sense, and that's why I love it. So, um, yes. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't know why that. So yeah, we're northeast Chateauneuf du Pape. Chateauneuf du Pape. Um, we're coming on to Chateauneuf du Pape, aren't we? So we, we are. Yeah. To, so you can leave we'll, Chateauneuf we'll du Pape alone now. for now. Yeah. We're going. We're going down to Côte d'Or. You're the one who brought up all the great varieties. Okay. Um, so yeah. Um, I, I think I think this is this is where you find the dominant style of the um, of the Grenache coming through, don't you? It's it is Grenache wines always just lead with this beautiful sort of fresh red fruit don't they so as, as far as far as there's a question about oak here so the Syrah spent a little bit of time in old french oak and that's just to kind of bring it along so it's not there for any flavor or any that kind of stuff so i can see it. and then the grenache is all done in uh concrete tanks and stainless steels and then blended in together so yeah there's there is oak used but there's not a big amount of oak going, hello, here's some oak. But yeah, I think this is cool, you know, and what, what, what's, what, what's fun about this is, and I think it's in the tasting notes that everyone's got is, you know, the Grenache is grown on one particular type of yeah. soil over here, which is the Marl, and then you've got the Syrah that's grown on the, uh, the stony terraces of crap on. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yes. Interesting. Um, and le plan de Dieu, the plan of God. Excellent. Um, the concrete tanks are quite widely used in this part of the world. Um, they're these big sort of cuboid con concrete tanks. Um, there are two benefits to using those concrete tanks. One is that they have a natural temperature um, control. control sort of environment without having to spend money on an expensive refrigeration system. Um, and so that's incredibly useful. And the other is that they... Um, Micro-ox. micro -ox, They allow in a little bit oh, of oxygen. I knew, I knew yeah, you were going to come in with a little really. micro -ox Well, it's, 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 I think it's an important thing because, you know, one of the most important things that barrels do for aging red wines is just to allow all the tannins and the colours to, to come together all, and and they need a little bit of oxygen to, to bind together and, um, and smooth themselves out. So if you want something that's got a bit of age, you, you want a bit of tannin in there. But it needs a little bit of oxygen to help it sort of all come together. So that's that's the, I think those are the two main reasons why the concrete tanks were so so popular. But also they're big and you don't have to do as much racking and you know managing the barrels. So barrels suck up a little bit of wine, <laughs> and you're constantly having to juggle wine around between barrels to try to keep things up. Um, but yeah. Um, 15% al alcohol, but it's in balance with the tannin and the fruit, and so it doesn't feel overpowering. But uh, it's. And I, and I think that's the thing 15% isn't as scary anymore as it was five years ago. 15%, no. I'm not saying it should be the normal, but you're seeing a lot more 40 and a half, 15%. Yes. It used to be an outlier, and it's really. 
not anymore. <clears throat> I'm going to just take this moment because um, we talked earlier this year about wine trips. And so... <clears throat> well, because we've got something slightly right, we'll bring it back up. Again. Yeah, why not? We, no, we, so... we wouldn't have mentioned that otherwise. <sighs> Uh, well, what can we say? Here we are presenting a 15% wine. As we've said, that there will be people looking towards doing lower alcohol wines. And we are seeing a bit of that. We've seen a few of these session wines coming out that are a little bit a little bit lower in alcohol and are designed so that you could have you know, a couple of glasses of that rather than one glass of something that's 15% and not have any sort of ad- adverse effects. So, um, but the trend in wine has been for alcohols to be going up. Partly because that's what people have been buying, and partly because that's what the world's been making. <clears throat> you know, people have been trying to bring harvests earlier and earlier and earlier forwards in the year um, in order to stop the alcohol levels going completely crazy. <clears throat> because, dare I say, it, the, the climate is changing and warming. Now, as it warms, it generates more sugar in the grapes. That means more alcohol in the wine. So, um, they're trying everything they can. They're cutting down the amount of foliage. They're spraying like special kinds of clay onto the leaves. They're, they're doing all sorts of things to try to moderate the influence of that. And, of course, they're harvesting earlier. But the problem with harvesting earlier is that there are two kinds of ripeness of a grape. There's the sugar ripeness and there is the, uh, there is the phenolic ripeness, the, the flavour ripeness. So... If you have an underripe grape, like let's say something like Cabernet Sauvignon, it's it's green. It's got this kind of like stalky, stalky chewy, chewy bell pepper, and particularly if you're going to use the stems in, you don't want underripe stems into your wine. So, <coughs> pardon me. Um, but yes, um, Sophia correctly points out the Robert Parker effect. Um, this is what people were recommending. The critics were recommending, and then it's what people were buying. So and, everyone was trending also, towards yeah. super rich, high big, alcohol, big, got big, big, big. And you can make <coughs> more money if you've made a 100-point wine yes. than if you've made a 97-point wine. So people pushed yeah. the boundaries of that richness and that ripeness and that alcohol yeah. to create a point Exactly. Story. But in a world where they didn't need to push it because it was happening naturally anyway, it was like, you know, red flag to a bull it's like all right then well we don't have to do anything different let's let's just let it go up to 15 16 percent um but yeah it's it, a lot of it's been driven by the the increased warming and i mean we see that here in england it's been good for english wine <laughs> it's not not so good if you're down in bordeaux and not so good if you're down in the rhone um and that's why a lot of these people are starting to change their blends and shift towards in particular in bordeaux introducing new grapes into the blends as well but yeah but yeah, the trends that we talked about, one of those trends was a trend towards lower alcohol wines. Um, the supermarkets are now putting huge amounts of pressure on wineries to um, introduce wines that are around 8 to 10% alcohol because uh, the duty is due to go up again next year. Thanks, Jeremy Hunt. Nice one. Um, <clears throat> and it's going to be a, 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 a graded system based on the percentage of alcohol. At the moment, we put it back and we put it back, but it's still due to come in. And unless something major changes, there's going to be a very steep 2025 duty increase for wines, particularly at 15%. Now, um, and a, a very strong incentive for them to drop down below, let's say, 9% in particular. That's sort of 8.5%, I believe, is one of the... Anyway, so there is a trend towards that. It's absolutely coming. The winemakers are complaining. They're putting pressure back, but that's what that's what the supermarkets are asking for. Um, <clears throat> other kind of trends that we talked about in the beginning of the year, we talked about a big trend towards Portuguese wines, didn't we? Yes. Um, and we're just seeing that time and time again. It's yeah. it's just uh, there is especially the uh, the the still wines, the, the non fortified yes. stuff. Yeah. Uh, the table, the, you know, what would have been table <coughs> wines for forever are coming through a good drinking, great value, some really good stuff. Re- really good stuff. Uh, I think my um, my white wine of the Waitrose tasting uh, was actually the Vino Verde, um, which was a, uh, a, it's only £6.99. So I'm telling you this, I shouldn't tell you, he's going to put me on mute now, oh, so that I don't, you're going to block me. <laughs> <laughs> just click outside of it, just left click. There you go. Uh, you're, you're, you're behind. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, so Vino Verde, a really nice natural fit for this. Um, the Waitrose one's 10.5% um, alcohol, but has a little bit of sugar in it. So it's a 7.5%. It was so beautifully balanced. It just brought that fruit. Um, your microphone's apparently dropped a little bit. It just really brought that fruit out. It's, it's, it's the, the classic vendor of Arinto, Loreiro, Aveso, Trajadora, and Fenel Puresh. Um, so, yeah, the Waitrose Blueprint Vigno Verde, that was a real, um, real find. And 10.5%. Uh, absolutely lovely uh, uh, everyday drinking sort of white wine. I, I, I really like that. Um, that so that was cool to see. Portugal definitely doing doing good things there. Um, and yeah, some lovely red blends as well. Is your thing dead? Yeah, it's decided it doesn't want to play. Oh, that's helpful. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. You want the world to know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I should be back in now. Fingers crossed. If, oh, yeah. if that doesn't work, I will add a different microphone. And but if it, yeah, if it doesn't work, you should be really happy. You don't have to listen to me anymore. Yeah, days. Okay, fantastic. Um, so should we um, should we head into um, Cadillac? Yeah, just ha having look. I, so there's a few people saying it's astringent. It's definitely tannic. Definitely tannic. Definitely chewy. Definitely fifteen percent. Mm -hmm. And you know, Resto, you know, they they. It's interesting because they they make a lot of sweet wines there as well. Yeah. Um, but it is this kind of rusticy farmyardy table wine kind of style <laughs> no and i mean that in a really yeah. good way it's, it's very like classic old french yep. um yeah it's not going to be overly refined um you know but it's it's still there's nice fruit there but it's it's not made to be do you know what i mean like commercially yep. quaffable drinkable it's still smooth. It's still balanced. It's got all the good things a wine should have, mm -hmm. but it does feel a bit. It's what you would expect if you were in the south of France. You go around to a winemaker's house. There's a bunch of cheese on the table, and you pour in a glass of yeah. red wine. Boom! That's what you get, isn't it? That it's kind of very, style. Very much. So. Does that make sense? I, I think it's... that absolutely does. Like, yeah, happily drink it any time. Not crazy, crazy exciting, but very classic French. It's a classic um, and Santana level smooth. That's pretty smooth. Um, made like Carlos Santana. Okay, very good. Right, we should move on now because we are going somewhere else now, aren't we? Yeah, we are going to uh, Cote de Rhone. Cote de Rhone. So just as we, oh, we yeah. dive in, uh, no, nah, we've uh, I've got one tech sheet because it's the same wine. Isn't Fair it? Enough. Um, so I just point out that when we when we talk about the Southern Rhone, Northern Rhone is about ten percent of the production of the Rhone Valley, and the Southern Rhone is about yeah, nine percent, and Cote de Rhone is the biggest bit of quality wine around there. Yeah. And it's interesting to say it's done very much about being regionality and not all Cote de Rhones are created equal. And no. you can get some very good ones, some very cheap and cheerful ones. And I think, you know, when we go on to the last wine, and if you've got two glasses, you want to pour them side by side because they're from the same winemaker, you absolutely can. Chateauneuf de Pape is, I think, the wine that anyone who's getting into wine and gets into France, when they go outside of like big regions, when it's not Bordeaux or it's not Burgundy or it's not Rhone, Chateau Neuf de Pape is yeah, it's the one people that get in. It comes around to Christmas and they come into you know into your wine shop or get online and go, I like a good Chateau Neuf de Pape, don't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's in the same class as I like a good Rioja. Um, mm -hmm. And Chateau Neuf de Pape is obviously. A, sm a, step up a, a, a smaller part of the Cote de Rhone. So it's the same region, yep. same grapes, a lot of the time the same winemaker, a um, lot of the time done in the same facilities, but is picking the, well, they say the best grapes. But there's also lots of different producers. So if you pick the right producer, you might find someone who's a really good producer, their Cote de Rhone oh. is better than someone else's Chateau Neuf de Pape. Yeah, that's fair. That because there's fair. Cote de Rhones out there that are more expensive than Chateau Neuf de Pape, depending on the producer. For sure, yeah, absolutely. And so we're, we're talking with like the kind of one of the most famous producers. Now, we have featured them in the past, but it's because, you know, they make Chateau Beaucastel. It's, 
is probably the most famous name in Chateauneuf du Pape, isn't it? Absolutely. And they are absolute pioneers of um, sustainable viticulture, of blending. They they love to use uh, all of the all of. The Well, other people have got sound. Hello, can you hear us? That's Alex is on the on the thing. Okay, just come. Let's come in close so we can use that one together. There we go. There we go. Fantastic. Bring the badger. Excellent. Um, I will bring the badger. Okay. So, sorry about that, chaps. There we go. Fantastic. Welcome Look back. Cool. Excellent. You know what we were talking? We were talking. We were talking about you know old school and four <laughs> years ago and. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of couple of months without a breakdown, so uh, you know, fantastic. It's uh, back back to our good old usual self. So, what do we get to? So, Perrin, um, you know, one of the most famous 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 families in in Cote de Rhone. Um, you know, they make uh, you know so many things. And I was saying that you know, I, I like wineries that have tiers. So you can there's wines that you can buy from them. You know, their their entry levels that you can drink all day every day. You can then go to Cote de Rhone with them, like we've got here. They've then got the Cote de Rhone Village, which is your next step up when it has named villages after it. Mm -hmm. Then you go up to their Chateau Neuf de Pap. Um, and the one that we've got with wine number six is their Les Sinards, which is from a particular vineyard. And then you go to their Chateau Bourcastel, which is their top top trumps of the uh of that so as you go up you just get this increasing quality this increasing intensity this increasing you know attention to detail and this increasing style but all starting with the same main blend of grenache mourvedre and syrah some of them will have other bits and pieces blended in maybe some quinoise they start like that and there are 18 grapes that you can you. Some people tell you 13, some people tell you 18. It just depends if you cast people and people agree and different little weird things as different yeah. stuff. So some people say 13, some people say 18. It really doesn't matter for the small amounts of the little bits at the back end of how much is being grown. Um, so yeah, I just think this is, when we talk about blends, this showcases what the different grapes do. If you have a single, you know, Grenache, mm -hmm. big, fruity, soft, easy drinking... You have a single Syrah, spicy, fruity, earthy. And you have a single uh, Mavedra or Monastrell or Mataro, depending where you are in the world. Um, because you don't see a lot of single vineyard, uh, single variety labelled Mavedra. It's usually no, no, Monastrell in Spain that. or Mataro yeah. in um, Australia. Australia. And that is kind of, a, kind of a weighty, fruity style wine. So you see where these things come together. So this is, once again, it's mainly Grenache. So you've got 70-ish 70, 70 percent Grenache um, and then about 15% each of the other two varieties. Now, when I smell this, um, you're going to hate me. I get a slightly Beaujolais note from, from it, don't you? Just that kind of slightly sort of kirschy, banana -y thing coming through. Must, must be the whole bunch. I think they probably do a bit of whole bunch. And it was, you know, when I last made Syrah, I did 40% whole bunch. Now, what does that mean for those who aren't bored sick of us talking about these different winemaking techniques? So, uh, generally speaking, when you go to a high-end winery like this, you take the grapes off the vine by hand. And in fact, I believe in Chateauneuf du Pape, you have to hand harvest yeah. them. Um, and so now you have your grapes that are this beautiful little cluster. Well, it might not be beautiful. You might need to cut a few bits of it out. Um, on these green stems. 
Uh, or if you're lucky, they've started to go brown and, and start to ripen up a bit. Now, those stems can add just a little hint of those sort of green flavours to it. Um, but also, there are two different ways of kind of fermenting it. There's the yeast, which has to get into the sugar, or actually can happen enzymatically, which is just a sort of a, 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 a very different mechanism to break down those sugars. Now, if you keep the grapes completely whole, which means you have to hand harvest them, you have to keep them in small containers so the weight doesn't start crushing them, um, then and you put them in, and particularly if you put it in with a bit of crushed stuff as well, then that starts making some carbon dioxide. And you start getting this, what, what's called carbonic maceration going on, which is um, a very different kind of fermentation technique going on in the whole grapes to what you've got in the crushed grapes. The crushed grapes is going off and it's doing its thing. And eventually, the hope is that the, the grapes will burst open and now the yeast starts going at it. But that develops flavours of banana of kish, of these kind of slightly confected, slightly artificial things. And it, it, it can just, you know, it's another component to add into the mix. Now, if you go all in, you're probably going to create something that tastes of Beaujolais Nouveau. And we can all agree nobody likes that because it's Gamay and nobody likes Beaujolais. Um, I, I nearly got punched for saying that today. But um, <laughs> um, but otherwise, if you just do a small percentage of it, 30, 40 percent, it can just add a little bit of a little bit of character to it. So I think there's a bit of that going on in this. I think they're they're quite, quite keen on it, the Perrin family. I've seen that note in yeah. a few of their wines. Yeah, so it's it's the there's a bit of the Serraris whole bunch. The Grenache is all destemmed, uh, mm -hmm. because you want that to be that fruity, rich kind of style. Yeah. And you get that kind of convected note, which kind of mellows the, you know rounds out the Syrah a little bit, you'll get that kind of little bit of banana-y yeah. kind of thing going on. And a little bit of green from the stems particularly. And so one of those things that um, I had a, a really excellent winemaker, and I can't remember who the hell it was, but they're American. Um, one of the techniques they use to work out what flavours... So you can sit there and you can look at these grapes and go, are these stems ripe enough or are they just going to give it this kind of underripe green flavour to it? What you should do is if you take your stem and you chop it up into little bits and you pour in some alcohol, some just pure alcohol, um, and then just let it sit there for a bit, that will act as a solvent to take all of those kind of flavours that you're going to get out of the stems. And you can then have a smell of that, have a little taste of that and see exactly what you're going to get. And that will give you a really clear idea of... Um, uh, of what exactly it's going to add to your mix in a very more intense sort of focused way but you can actually then see what that's going to be and so you can make your decision yeah i'm going to de-stem everything which means you run it through this big machine which has blades flying around and uh, well, little paddles flying around and pushes the grapes out through holes um and then generally speaking we'll run them through uh, a, a couple of little rollers that sort of crush them gently they're, they're set to a little distance part just just slightly smaller than the grape but not enough to crush you're not pressing them you're just crushing them um um so yeah that's 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 the alternative to that but at some point you're going to press the press the wine so to, to Helen's yeah. point that no one likes gamay he is no one i don't that's what I meant to say. I don't like yes, it. Uh, uh, mm. Yeah, personal personal preference in wine. I've I, I, I've been taking offence to the fact that a lot of um, pubs that I've been to recently have been saying, "Oh, we've got a nice Bo a Burgundy." They haven't called it Beaujolais. They said, "We've got a nice Burgundy." This one's from Brewery. I was like, "That's Beaujolais. That's not Burgundy. That's like." Well, don't get upset. The, the world's the world's Not changing. Right. The world's changing. And everything's moving on. Yeah, Speaking of moving on, should we have a look at the tasting okay. notes and then drink some? Uh, yeah, let's get on to it. Do yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it won't let somebody say tart. <laughs> <sighs> what has the world come to? Wow. It's because in the good old days, people can people couldn't be trusted to um you know we had to put the uh, moderator on, didn't we? Because people couldn't be we trusted. Did. Caramel. Now there is a really kind of like a, a nice caramelly note to that. I wonder where that's coming from. Would that be from like the toasty oak or that's either the oak or it's a little bit to do with the mm. um the whole bunch where you get that that kind of it comes through that carbonic and you end up with a little bit of almost stewed fruit. Which can taste a little bit caramelly, so it's almost like a like a fruit pie kind of thing. So it's it's almost like 
Um, you know, caramelized sugars. Okay, that makes sense. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. We've all got our, our favourites. My gamay experience was, uh, generally speaking, slightly informed by uh, an encounter with it, a, a too much of it at a young age on a Beaujolais Nouveau night in Tunbridge Wells, where I might have decorated one of the finest restaurants of Tunbridge Wells in a shade of red. Let's so, not go into that. Anyway, so we are heading to Chateau Neuf de Pape, the new house of the Pope, because uh, <clears throat> you know, back in the day, the Pope got bored of a. Uh, the Vatican, yep. and decided to head over to Avignon, hang out for a bit, build a castle, yep. grow some grapes, make some wine. I mean, if you get the I, chance I, I to go to... Ov- I overly simplified that, didn't I? Maybe, maybe. It's a little bit. Bit. If you do get the chance to go to Chateau de Pap, it's, it's, it's a really nice little town. They do a lovely medieval festival in the middle of summer, um, or sort of towards the end of summer, and it's a really joyous experience. You can go and see sort of, you know, recreations of like jousting and there are all sort of tables laid out in the street that people are feasting on and medieval feasts and you can then go of course and go tasting in the cellars of the town it's it's a good place it's a good place so this i love so this is lissinard and it is basically baby bow castell baby bow castell nice. baby bow um so from the um from the vineyards of chateau <laughs> bow castell but mm-hmm. the younger vines um, ah, so right. you're going to have a little bit more acidity, a little bit more, I say freshness, um, you know, younger fruit, kind of like that riper, brighter, crunchier fruit that when you get to the older vines, you'll have, you know, with, if you were comparing it to Beau Castel, it would be, you know, this kind of like decadent, concentrated, deeper, darker, richer yeah. flavors. This is more, you know, cranberry kind of things rather than, um, you know, Plums and black fruits. So, Beaucastel, just for comparison, this sells for about seventy, you know, sixty-five, seventy-five pound a bottle. Um, and that's, you know, it's a very collectible wine. Um, I, I find it a bit strange. We did it in um our um Christmas um, master Christmas masterclass a couple of years ago, and I'd never tried it before. And and there's there's something which really intrigues me there because there's someone said custard. And <clears throat> yeah, I got this really bizarre custard thing from the Bocastel. So, so this is definitely a junior Bocastel from that point of view. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, but I like this a lot more than I like that one. I think that one just needed a little bit more time to to develop it. So the Bocastel we had what? It two was two, years, two years, wasn't it? Well, yeah. we had it two years ago when it was 2019, mm-hmm. and so it absolutely was. So, now and, th- and this right. is the thing about you know the right wine for the right time is if you want to drink it right now, drink Coderon current vintage, drink Coderon Village current vintage, don't drink Chateau Neuf current no. vintage. You need three years minimum, but you know it can go on for a long, long time. I and mean, a lot of that. supermarket Chateau Neufs are, of course, designed to be drunk on release. And yet, then you're not getting the best out of it. You might as well be drinking a Cote de Rona. You may as well spend the same money on it. Yeah. And I'm not knocking anyone here. <laughs> Buy a Cote de Rhone. You know, you shouldn't be you shouldn't be buying a Chateauneuf de Pape for 15, 20 quid. No, that's I fair. don't think. No, I'm with you on that. You can, but you're better to buy a 15, 20 quid bottle of Cote de Rhone Village yep. from a good producer. You're going to have a better time. It's going to be more approachable, better drinking, ready to go. But there is something nice about, you know, having that bottle of, that embossed bottle of shallow yeah. after bath <clears> on the table. It looks, it looks, it looks the part, doesn't it? Now, you say, and there's an interesting I, discussion going on about corn flour and custard, but you, you're going to talk you about say, glass. You say this wonderful embossed bottle, and um, yeah, I, I think we need to quickly pull up the badge cam because. Um, uh, here we have our beautiful bottle of Bocassel, sorry, of Chateau de Pat Lissinal from uh, Family Perron. And as we look up, it is not embossed. It ain't embossed. It's a fake. It's a fake. We've got fake wine, have we? No, we have not, because we wouldn't do that. Um, <clears throat> but what we have got is a situation where uh, a couple of years ago, um, some bloke called Vladimir decided to invade. Um, Ukraine. Mm-hmm. You've done COVID, you've done Boris, you're now on... Yeah, I'm on Putin. You are. Um, wow. 
and and this is all a direct knock on from well it's, it was it, i think it started off in in covid times but it, it was certainly massively exasperated by um the destruction of a lot of the glass factories in ukraine um and um i've been challenged on twitter in the last week or so so somebody said to me why do you keep banging on about the need for us to move to alternative packaging from glass bottles? Well, I mean, part of it is <laughs> you have to source it from war-torn parts of the world. But um, does anyone want to guess how much glass we use no, for no. packaging? Just tell, just tell them. Oh, no. Okay, no one's going to know that. Just tell, you could right. have, put, you so put that in the quiz if you for, wanted to. I could have done, but I didn't think about it. So for glass bottles and jam jars and all the kind of just products that we put in consumable products that we have, we use 5 million tonnes of glass a year in the UK, just in this country. 5 million tonnes of glass. And someone said, if we were to make that using electricity from, let's say, solar panels or wind farms, <clears throat> what... Why wouldn't that be a green way of doing it? And someone said, well, transport. You have to transport these things around. They're heavy and wasteful and they aren't dense and that's fair. So I said, well, what about electric trucks? And yeah, it's like, yeah, there's an argument here. <clears throat> I get the argument. I get the argument. But there was something that just didn't quite click to me. So I went and I did the maths on how much energy it takes to recycle 5 million tonnes of glass every year, or 5 billion kilograms. And it turns out that's the same amount of power that would power 1.7 million typical UK homes. So we have the choice. We could either move 1.7 million homes over to green energy, um, or we could use Do glass. glass. Do glass. And the reality of it is that of the glass we consume in this country, the vast majority of it is sourced from Europe or from um, or from China. So uh, t key places for importing glass are France, Germany, Italy, and China in, I think, that order. Um, but a, a lot of the German bottle factories were using Ukrainian glass. So, um, yeah, there's a good question about what about bottle aging without glass? Yeah, I think for the high-end wines that need bottle aging, there's probably still a place for glass. But most wines get drunk within a week of purchase. Yeah, so I, I think that's, I think that's the yeah. thing. It's 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 not one solution fits <clears throat> everything. It's about having the opportunities yes. and you know being smart things. Yeah, there are places for cans, like for the picnic. I think yeah. that's a great solution. You know, there are places for a bag and box. If you're having a party, that's a great solution. Wine in a keg, great for a bar keg, where yeah. you don't want to have a load of wastage Quite and right. pour it quickly. So. I just think yeah, it's, it's it's important to realise that because of how the wine gets you uh -huh. isn't indicative always of its quality. No. As long as it turns up and it's your glass and it's good, why not? Right. Um, most wines, uh, certainly a lot of the wines that come from Australia and New Zealand, um, are shipped over, from overseas in containers. Absolutely right. You get a, a, a half container, a 20-foot one, which contains 12,000 litres of wine, or a 24, uh, sorry, a 40-foot container, which contains 24,000 litres of wine. And that then goes off into um, a factory like Greencroft, and they will either use glass made in the UK quite often a lot of it from, from Europe or China, um, and they will then fill it in the UK in like Manchester or somewhere. Like there's, a, there's a big one down in Bristol. Yeah. It's like, yeah, there's a few of them around the UK. But, but yes, you're right. It turns out that it is more carbon intensive to ship a bottled bottle of wine in glass from Bordeaux than it is to ship that same 75 centilitres of wine from New Zealand in a container, so so that's the vast waste that the uh, that 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 goes into. Um, hey, well, everyone's yeah. This, this, this is a fascinating question. discussion. We should just have a barrique at home and just tuck into. It. I agree. Yes. Um, yeah, uh, recycling rates in the US are about thirty percent, um, and uh, yes, uh, it's it's more like seventy five percent over here, heading towards eighty percent. Um, if you want to talk about DRS and deposit re re uh, no, return we, schemes, no, you don't no, want no, to. No, we don't. Talk to you on Twitter. No, okay, um, that's irrelevant. So, what do we think of the Chateau Tupac? What are people liking? Are they, is this is this good? Italian preserve. Taste of Newcastle. 
That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Newcastle, Chateau Nerf. Oh, sorry, I thought it was <laughs> Newcastle. Yeah, I thought it was. Dear uh, twenty three in the Big Brother house. Under, Drinking un- Chateau Nerf, you pap. Un- underrated and only turns up one a- once a year. <laughs> It's a football joke, and I got it. Excellent. Well done. Well done. Well done. So, while while people are having this final sip, should we should we go to the uh, the end of show quiz? We should. Let's go to the quiz. So, for okay. those who have joined us before, get yourselves in. We're going to give you a minute to get in while you're drinking Shadow Nerf to pop. Get your name in the prize. As always, if you win, you can send your friend a, a tasting, free tasting, free tasting for next month. That's We're doing terroir, exactly. And while oh, everyone's yeah. going. While everyone's getting their names in, I'm just going to... I've had a few emails this week about uh, things that people like and want to do and all that kind of stuff. So I'm going to do a quick summary while we get the names in. Then we can do the quiz and then I can let you all go on your happy evenings. So first things first, we did send an email out. We launched our advent calendar because we're excited by it. We're going to do 24 days around the world, very Phileas Fogg style. It is on discount until the end of the month for uh, pre-order. So jump in now. It's 85 quid rather than 100 quid. So jump in, get it now if you want it. Fantastic. It'll probably end up being more than 100 quid as well. I think it might be 100 plus postage just because the cost of wine's gone up. But but it, it helps us know how many to make, which is immensely useful. Um, um I think we've got a good number of people in. Okay. Um, but I'm, yeah, I'm so sorry, I'll let me finish. You haven't he's, finished getting, he's getting upset by the cost of wine. Um, mm-hmm. So second thing, I got, uh, I've had a couple of emails this week about people wanting to drink super premium wine with friends and the friends being, yes, recent advent calendar, uh, people on this club. So um, if anyone fancies it, there was the idea of going back to the old school zoom thing with a with a smaller group of people drinking some super premium wines that we could uh break down and send out and just open up a zoom and rather than me and alex sitting here and presenting it more kind of like a book club so we just set up a zoom open the wines up chat about it have fun with it so i say a little less structured than this if that's actually possible um but without it <laughs> without it being a uh you know a wine show as this we'd have a zoom where we'd all sit around and we'd all just kind of Chat about that. So if anyone fancies that, uh, pop me an email, give me a shout, send us a Facebook, whatever you like to do, and then we can work out the best way to set up and get the uh, the wines out to people. And finally, two tastings ago, everyone said they wanted Francia Corta. We now have Francia Corta uh, from yes. Bella Vista. So if you need some Bella Vista Francia Corta, jump on the website and buy some. Um just for people, the the, the eight the tw- eighty sorry twenty four days around the world. We're not doing eighty days of Advent. Um, twenty four days around the world. We start in England. We go uh, through France, Germany, Austria, uh, Italy, Greece, and we're heading down towards. Um, we, we're going through the Middle East, aren't we? We're going to go Romania. Oh yeah, yeah, Eastern Europe. Yep. Maybe Lebanon on the way through, then yep. Japan, China, down to Australia, New Zealand, back on around a little bit through. Um, the Americas, yeah, down through South America, off to uh, South Africa, back up through Madeira, Madeira, Spain, Portugal, yeah. back to England is the thing. There we go. Okay, anyway, right. we are ready for quiz, a quiz. time. It's quiz time. We're going to start. Question one: Which Cote du Rhone village, established in 1974, is known for its complex reds and elegant whites? And the translation of village in French is village. Well done. There we go. So is it Condria? Gadania, Sable, or saint Oh, lots of people saying Condria. Are they right, though? No. What? There we are. Nobody got there it There are right, no I? reds in Condria. Condria is a white. It is white. Okay. It's so who answered quickest? Racist. Um... <laughs> oh, well, Joan Bell's in the lead, top of the with, lead. With, with, with no questions right. Excellent. <laughs> so Lirac and Tavel make some of the best examples of this type of wine. Is it rosé, sparkling, red, or sweet? You, you're, mm. not, you're not saying white. You're not giving them white as an option. Or white. <laughs> or or no. also white. No. Um, this this definitely goes into one of our uh, our trends, doesn't it? As well, because it we talked about bold oh, roses. We have got a strong and yes. indeed strong trend towards rose. The rose is the correct answer. Viola, Viola in, the lead. in the lead. Excellent. Okay, next question. 
What is the name of the one wind that blows to the road? Oh my god, Le Grand Windy Windy. I thought that's absolutely Le Mistral or Le Vent du Rhone or the Bora. You don't like giving all the options, do you? No, apparently. <laughs> that, that one was a bit boring. Oh my god. <laughs> but then yeah. you put Le Grand Windy Windy extra points. So <laughs> really. Okay. Yeah, I think most people have got this one. Well, you, we've only mentioned, mentioned, mentioned it 48,000 times. Okay. The Von du Rhone is a perfectly plausible it's, answer, but it is wrong. Or so it is the it is wind one. of the Rhone. Yep, the wind of the Rhone. Right, well, staying in top. the lead. Okay, what are galets? Is it local horses used to get up and down the steep slopes of the Rhone Valley? A type of pruning to keep warm air down the roots of the vines? Or jackets that are put around the vines to protect from the strong wind winds? Can you just read all the options? <laughs> or stones deposited by ancient glaciers. Yeah. Lots of people going for the, the answer that I did not mention, which so, is indeed the correct So the galets one. are the same as the pudding stones You're that we talked stone. about earlier. Okay. Viola's still top still of the list. Top of the list. Top of the pops. Which of these grapes are not permitted in Chateauneuf du Pape? Syrah, Cabernet Sauvignon, Terre Noir, or Cunoise? Hmm. I wonder. No. This is a tricky one. This is a tricky one. It is. You know, if you'd, if you'd answered... If I had answered... I gave you the option to get the whole list. list. If you played, stuff. you would have had the whole list during the tasting. Lots of people going for Cabernet Sauvignon. It's correct. Well done. Okay. Oh, Kevin's Kevin jumping top. on. Two seconds, just, in two seconds in it. Just two seconds in it. So which term is used for the large wooden casks used for aging wine in the Rhone Valley? Is it the barrique, the foudre, the puncheon, or the hogshead? These are all indeed types of they, barrels. They are. And I didn't even mention all of them as long as I got that one right. Exactly. Watch this. I'm going to put this in and then someone's going to come back to me and go, no, 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 actually, this, 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 actually, actually this, is, this, is, this is right. Now, lots of people saying the barrique. Would you say a barrique is large? Barrique is, is is a good size. It's a good size. It's 300 bottles of wine, as we've discussed earlier. But it's more closely associated with Bordeaux, isn't it? Absolutely. And Burgundy. So, the so foudre, foudre is the large is one the that we find in the one. Rhone. Indeed. What has that done to our league table? It leaves Kevin five out of six oh, on the top. Oh, yep. It's still close, though. Now, what is this gizmo? Is it a, desi- a, a device to help open older bottles of wine? Or is it to measure the length of the cork? To match the bottle before you order corks, or is it so that you could take out and replace cork without damage, so you can make fraudulent wines? Well, we've got Rudy here. <laughs> Bloody hell! Okay, um, good question. Oh, there was another one. Our device to help us push pouches into the cartons. Yeah, I, we I don't. Know, we don't that have one. We don't. We don't have one of them. Do we? Don't we? have one of those. No. No. That's what we got hands for. We have a bloody high tech spatula that doesn't work. Anyway, that is all good fun. What was the correct answer? It was a it's device an asso. to help. It is an asso. Um So what you do with this is you 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 kind of um um I'm going to have to do this. You have to sort of wiggle it into the wine uh, uh, on either side of the cork, and then you can sort of turn it around and extract it. To stop, you know, yeah. if you've got an old bottle, you put the cork through down the middle, and it just disintegrates, yeah. it stops that happening. Yeah, it's very it's very good. Okay, back to the quiz. Back to the quiz. Did okay. You, did you make it go big so everyone can see it? Kevin you, is in the lead. Face. And, okay. Which grape variety is often blended with Syrah to add perfume and floral notes? I told you all that. Morvedre? Malsan, Viognier, or Rousse. I've got the hiccups. That's, That's probably from tasting wine at Waitrose all day. Doom. What do we got? Viognier is the uh, most popular answer, and it's right, it's indeed. Correct. So is this the... Oh, no, no, not quite. So, leaderboard. Kevin's staying in the lead, but it is a very closely fought thing. Okay, which of the following is a sub-appellation of the Northern Rhone known for its powerful, age-worthy Syrah wines? Is it Vaquera, Corna, Tavel, or Luberon? Hmm. 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 Or is it Yellowtail? 
We've got some Kona, we've got some Luron, we've got some Telvo, we've got a bit of everything, but it is Kona. It is. There we go. Kevin still in the lead, in the but lead. there's all to play to, all, all to play, play for. for. Which famous Rhone appellation is known for producing exclusively white wines? Chateauneuf, I think Amitage, I might, I you think might have given this I one might away. I have alluded to that earlier oh, from God. the first question. Condrieu or Gigonda? But who knows, after an hour and a half with us, they might not be listening anymore. <laughs> if they got any sense anyway exactly the answer is Condria and the final question Badgers I, I thought you deleted this no I left it right, I'm just going to get rid of that there we go okay anyway everyone knows the answer is Badgers so Kevin congratulations that was a very closely fought thing and uh, well done that is that is excellent so Kevin so, pop us an email and let us know where we need to uh Oh, oh so I only missed question. the first question and you only were one question. Oh, gutting, gutting. Okay, all right. Well, we're gonna have to you'll have to get revenge on that in the next tasting for sure. Um but Kevin, pop us an email yeah, and an let email. us know who you would like to send the tasting pack for next month to. For next month is Terroir. Terroir. Yes. Yeah, we haven't quite decided exactly what we're gonna do, have we? But we but... do have two Oregonian wines from other yes. sides. Two sides of a vineyard to go on two different two soils. different soils. So it will be that's what we're trying. We're going to do. do a tasting of three sets of two to show how terroir goes through. We're then going to go. So that's going to be June. You know, that's May. Then we've got June. July is going to be Riesling, and then uh, we're going to be doing. Oh, we're going to be doing Alsace later in the year. And also for anyone who likes to travel, um, I am going to be doing Oxford Wine Festival this year in September. I'm going to be doing a live masterclass of Alsatian wines. So with anyone, cheese, isn't it? Not with no, cheese this year. I did. Cheese. I did it with cheese last year. Oh, I thought I read that you were doing that. Okay. Yeah, no, right. they haven't put the new tastings up. So if you look at the Oxford Wine Festival, it says I'm doing wine and cheese, but I'm yes, not. I does. will be. I shall be doing okay. Alsace. So oh, if anyone wants not. to come to Oxford and hang out, I should be there. So before on we move on, it's been prices? an absolute pleasure. We can put the, yeah. Let's put the prices up. So, funnily enough, the Chateau Neuf du Pape is the most expensive, but I think for me that Viognier was. Banging value that is, um, yeah, at fourteen quid, that that Viognier was was excellent, and and I think the question that I always ask yeah. people is about quality of wine. Mm. Would you rather, and it's your choice, have three bottles of the Cote d'Arène or one bottle of the Chateau Neuf de Pape? And that's mm. only for anyone to decide. And yeah, as we said, if you love the wines, get them, buy them, anything you like. Um, any orders over sixty pounds, free delivery. So. And if there's stuff that you want oh, to get from previous night. tastings, give us we a shout. We wine of the night as well, shouldn't we? Okay, yeah. I'll pop it on wine of the night just because while we're talking about that. Number five is an absolute bargain. For a wine of that quality from a producer of that quality and that uh, heritage, I think it's great. Um, I think the... Uh, I, I like both the, the the whites, actually. I thought both the whites were really good. Um, um, I, I mean, obviously, I liked all of them, but... Um, but yeah, I I think that I think me, it showcase I'd... it showcases you know the levels of style, the levels of quality that you can get throughout um, throughout the region, and it's great. You know, it was six very different wines, <laughs> very different styles. Um, but yeah, before we go tonight, we we've been worrying about things. There's been this massive rate rise in um, AI, and uh, wine professionals getting a bit nervous that AI is going to replace them and get rid of you know their their tasting notes, their yeah. content, their pictures they put online. But you know what the worst could thing could happen? Could we be replaced with AI? Probably. Could they replace our songs? Oh, that's a good well, question. Well, I, I don't know. Let's let's have a look at the wine of the night. Um, oh, it's very close at the moment. Close Hermitage. Well, there's still for, people for now, There's still a couple of people having a good rank there. Oh, oh it's jumped. Well, I think that, that's it. That's it. Everyone's done. It is incredibly close, but um, the wine of the night is, and by a narrow amount, is the Cote du Rhone. Interestingly, the, the Chateau Neuf, which I think most people would have liked as a wine, is just uh, edged out because we've done this on because the... we put the pricing oh, on no, first. So people, haven't. we've done the pricing. So, yeah, and I think you're right. It is good, but when comparison is the enemy of joy as uh, Carl Lambert from Takara said. Sometimes when you see things side by side you go, is it worth that much extra? Um, exactly. So have we got any any so final thoughts in the chats before we let Final thoughts go. in the chat. Fantastic tasting. 
Uh, look forward to catching you next month as well. Another vote for Wine 3 there. Um, Kathy's dad likes uh, Kathy's Grand Malbec made by Kathy, which is which is good. Um, the votes are incredibly close, but um, Kathy, yeah. if you're gonna if you're gonna <laughs> announce other wines on the tasting, you've got to send them out to everybody. It's true, and it is also World Malbec World Malbec World Day. So, exactly. Yeah. Um, but anyway, but yes, anyway, I really hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it useful. Um, it's a it's a really cool region, and there's a there's a there's a bloody good reason that the that so many people are so keen to take the grapes from this wonderful part of the world and take them all around the world. And um, and thank you very uh, much if you were first tasting because hey, welcome. I hope and, you enjoyed it <laughs> and you appreciate my shirt and that's what really matters. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, extra points for that. Have a wonderful Brilliant. night. Take care. And, uh, good night, all. And watch we'll out. See you next watch week. Watch out for them badges. Yeah. Take care. Just take a look. Through vines they dash And eat those grapes with the It's just the badges But in a way that makes you Guard your grapevine lump I can make you clap your hands Now they're all gypsy with their furry prance Leaving no grapes, not a single chance Sipping on the vineyards fine, it's like some lords It's just the badgers living life in happy hordes They'll drink you dry Under the moon's embrace Just badgers in the vineyard A tipsy, happy rain